Hey everyone, welcome to Right On, the podcast from Final Draft. This is the show where we talk about all things screenwriting. Today we have an interview with Sarah Smith, co-writer and co-director of the new animated film, Ron's Gone Wrong. Hi, insert registered name. I am your, 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 I am. My B-Bot. B-Bot. Look, my best friend out of the box. I am, insert registered name, best friend out of my box. Insert registered name is my best friend. Please connect me to the bubble network. Uh, uh, how? You're not online? So how am I supposed to fix that? No problem. I'll scan my database to find out how to do it. Oh, great. Cool. The answer to your question is on the bubble network. Mm. Bye, Please connect me to the Bubble Network. Insert registered name. Oh, stop, stop saying that. It's not my name. No problem. Please select the name from my internal database. Adash, Aaron, Abraham, Absalom. Absalom? Hi, Absalom? Sarah and host Sade Sellers discussed the film's extensive world building and the research that went into it, the challenges of writing animation, her approach to writing for younger audiences, and more. Check it out. Welcome back to Write On, everyone. I'm so excited to speak with this artist today because I got to attend a special screening for this film and I absolutely adored, loved this movie. She made me laugh. She made me cry, which frustrates me because I'm, I'm a thug. I don't like to cry, but I did because this movie is so heartfelt and touching. It's Wrong's Gone Wrong. And this is Sarah Smith. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Shade. Nice to meet you. <laughs> so first of all, how is it in London? Is that where you're based out of? It is. It's really, really cold and horrible right now. So there you go. <laughs> I was I'm out in LA for the premiere of Wrong's Gone Wrong. And so I've come back from sunshine to breathe. It's funny. It's like the grass is always green on the other side. I would love to be where you are. I love cold. I love rain. I love that whole London vibe. It's way too hot here. It makes no sense to me. But, you know, we're, <laughs> we are where we're meant to be. Yeah. Um, I want to start with this. The title of the film. I want to know how you landed on that. Wrong's gone wrong which I feel like I need to say 10 times very fast. <laughs> well, for a long time, the working title was originally the B-Bots were called Me-Bots. And then, you know, we had to clear everything. And so they got changed. And then we came up with the name Ron for the character. And then we had a kind of brainstorm about a year in with a bunch of people going, what are the options for it? And I just wanted something that felt an inherently comedy title, you know, that was a little bit intriguing. So that's where it came from. I can't remember who suggested it, but it just stuck. I love it. And I was speaking of the B-Bots, first of all, they're the, that is the best idea and I'm so curious to know how it was incepted because after I left the film, I went, that's definitely where we're leading. It reminds me of Tamagotchis when I was a kid. We had these little remote yeah. keychains. But I feel like the Bebops would work. And just the whole world building in general, like how does how do you start that? It feels like there's so much world building in this film because there is. You're basically building this concept from scratch with taking the Bebops to school and that they change their colors. Like how technically involved in in depth do you guys get when it comes to that stuff massively and crazily you know that's the thing about animation it takes so long you have too much time to think but the original idea in a way was kind of simple and it was that I was like every parent you know my daughter was then like three or four and I was completely freaking out about screen time and the fact that her relationship with her iPad and what that meant about her relationship with other children and I thought you know we need to find a way to make an iPad into like a character in a movie so that we can explore kids relationships relationship with their phones and their devices, their iPads, their phones, you know. And so it, the brief was make me a walking, talking iPad. But all of the research around that, I mean, there are many, many people who are trying to make that device, the one that is your little home robot friend. When you look at all of the adverts for them, you realize they're all kind of startups and they all kind of tellingly, they're all shot in bungalows with wooden floors because they still have that <laughs> problem upstairs, right? But because we're in animation, we could make the device, which is kind of the dream. And all Although there is a lot of world building, we had an awful lot to draw from because we knew it had to have chat and likes and 
apps, you know, and it had to be and, and it was going to be a 360 degree touch screen. And so we made it aspirational what you would do if you turned your phone into a little walking, talking thing. And we also consulted with people who were toy makers and robot makers, you know, to say what is possible and what's the next generation of what you would want to be possible. And then we put all of that into that device. What's really lovely about this film is that even though it's bebops and technology, I related to it back when I was a kid and I was his age. It's like I didn't have the right shoes. There was the hot shoe that came out that market. Everyone could afford it, but my family couldn't afford it. Right. That's something that sticks with you (laughs) for a long time. You know, every single kid has that experience. This is the thing that bemuses all parents. It's like, how can you all be the last one to have something like every single kid goes, everyone else has. And I think it's even harder at the moment because things move so fast. And, you know, your kid has one gaming thing and then all their other friends are on another one. And they're like, but I'm the only one who doesn't have it. And you're caught in this terrible thing of thinking this isn't good for them to constantly give kids stuff to keep up. On the other hand, you see how it feels to be isolated. So I think we all know that feeling. We all know that experience. Yeah, it's, it's a terrible feeling, honestly. And I, I do agree with you. It's like you give in. You teach your kid that there's value in material things and not in who they are, but then you don't give in and and they're mercilessly teased because kids are horrible. What do you think um, the cost value for a Bebot would be in our world? Because I was like, that's got to be thousands of dollars for a child's toy. I know. I mean, I never wanted to think about that because, you know, I guess you have to imagine that it would be subsidized by their kind of plan, you know? Yeah, right, right. (laughs) It would be thousands, wouldn't it? You know, but it would have to be accessible. But it needed to also feel kind of premium that it would be out of the reach, out of the reach of people. And then in terms of the emotional beats in this film, what were the conversations like that we have to hit these emotional beats, especially by the end? There's a lot of setup in the beginning of the film. I'm not trying to spoil it because that ending is so well deserved. Like it's fulfilling, but it's also very sad. What are the conversations like with the filmmakers behind the scenes? Like, okay, this needs to happen. We need to make sure we're hitting these emotional beats along with plot. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm always, but you know, and and just to say, you you know, you're interviewing me as the writer of Ron, but I'm the joint writer. I write with Pete Bainham, who's been my writing partner for years. He's my best friend out of the box, you know. I've known Pete for like 35 years, and we have so much shared kind of friendship and memories, and you know, emotional relationships, etc. You know, and and all the people we know in common. So when we're setting something up, for me, when I start a film. What makes me want to do a movie is I need to know the concept, the big idea, in this case, the idea that everyone has a walking, talking device and this kid has one that doesn't work. I need to know what it's really about. And what it's really about is friendships in the world of algorithms and what the ending's going to be. And I, I'm not going to say the spoiler alert, but I knew where Barney needed to be as a character at the very end. Once you have those, everything else, I think, can be joined the dots. The only difficult thing is that joining the dots is, you know, there are so many versions of what can happen in between. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, the, so you rewrite and rewrite those things. But I think the main planks of the story kind of stay the same. In animation, I think they change far more than in other screenplays, you know, that, that you rewrite and change sequences because the bar is very high in terms of entertainment value and it being very, very tight. You know, people are going to spend so much time working on those, animating them, that you feel like every word must be earned <laughs> and nothing yeah. must be spare. It's so expensive per minute. So I think, you know, we knew a lot about what the emotional story was, but you go back and forth. I think probably the hardest thing in this script is that thing of a kid who is kind of on the back foot. You know, he is a bit of an outsider. He doesn't have friends. That kid can't be a loser. And writing that first act where you're setting up that kid and you need to feel, you need the audience to go, well, he's me. And yet you're showing him not being the successful kid all the time. It's really difficult to walk the line of like empathize with him, but don't think of them as, you know, as kind of pathetic or don't have them be off-putting by being such a loser. And to me, the answer to that in a character is A, you make them witty, B, you make them energetic. So they're not just passive, you know, and you see, obviously you have to see the world through their eyes. Right. But right. it's that thing of them. And, and, and the most important thing is that he's not sorry for himself. Yeah. You know, he's not yeah. sorry for himself at all. And I think that allows you, you know, to do what you need to do. So in the film, Barney puts together this like 
web, the spider web of what makes a good friend, right? These are the the pieces that make a centralized good friend. What are your three pieces that make a good friend? (laughs) You know, you have to, I guess it is about knowing the other person, warts and all, all the crappy things that they don't want you to know. And it doesn't matter that sense. I guess the best friend in the world is someone where whatever you did, however you screwed up, however badly behaved you were, that they, you know, that they're still going to come back and be your friend. Yeah. That, yeah. That's the thing that nothing is going to change. Yeah. That was my favorite part of the film too. It's, it's this kind of unconditional love that you get from family members that it's expected, but from friends, it's usually not received well. So a good friend is someone who will love you through all of your mistakes. And that's why I really love the Bebops. In terms of Barney's family, they, they and forgive me, I'm not quite sure what culture it is, but it's, it's a different culture than the kids in their neighborhood. So where did that inspiration come from? Yeah. I mean, you know, the idea is that he has a Bulgarian grandmother, an Eastern okay. European, I mean, obviously American, <laughs> is made up of so many families who've, you know, at some point kind of arrived in America, including European. And But you know what? That lady, that kind of indomitable kind of, you know, <laughs> strong, you know, the kind of, we always used to say she's the kind of woman who says that all parts of a chicken can be eaten. I feel like they exist in <laughs> cultures right you know someone that can mend the tractor use the tractor wring the chicken's neck make the food <laughs> yes i was gonna say because my my grandma she recently passed away but uh she's an uh, was also an immigrant from belize and seeing even though that woman's bulgarian i was like that's my grandma <laughs> like they are the same person the person who's gonna love me no matter what who doesn't understand why no kids are showing up to my birthday party because i'm the best thing in the world and she's like yeah. why doesn't anyone be your friend and I yeah. love that character and how lucky were you to get such an iconic star to voice that character, which I didn't I even recognize. No, I know. Well, Olivia, you know, Olivia Coleman to us before she was an amazing, you know, Oscar nominated star, et cetera. She was she started in the UK as a brilliant comedian who is one of our heroines just as a comedian on television. And so when you're thinking about someone that can bring that kind of warmth and strength of character and comedy, Olivia was kind kind of an obvious choice, although also not obvious, given that she plays, you know, an extremely large, short Bulgarian <laughs> grandmother. <laughs> so in every other way, completely different. <laughs> and, and even Zach, like, is unrecognizable to me until I read the credits. I go, he's, I've never seen him in a role like this, and he's perfect for it. And he did such a great job masking himself and becoming this bebot as well. Yeah. That was really hard finding the voice for that because, you know, it's about the relationship between this bot and the kid. And you can't have like a deep male voice. Otherwise, it feels like he's got a man under his bed. (laughs) So you've got to find a kind of light toned voice and you've got to find someone who feels very straight. But you're asking yourself the question of, is he making a point? Does he have a point of view? Because when we built the character of the B-Bot, we were very careful. Pete and I were very careful to build Ron out of things he had seen and heard. So the language he uses and what he says are phrases that he's seen in previous scenes. So you're constantly going back into earlier scenes to go, what does he know? What does he think? And that is gradually building together to a sort of point of view. But at no point do we cross that line and say he's conscious. (laughs) Right. we, We never do that. We always kind of say, well, is he just really procedural, you know? And then from from script to screen, how how long is this process? Crazy. I mean, it took us about probably 18 months on script, eight, maybe two years, which is not that long in some people's worlds in terms of development, but then three years in production. Wow. And over that time, we must have written three or four more drafts. And wow. you know what? interesting probably the thing that I feel best about is that when I watch the movie I feel that's the one that we were aiming at at the beginning and sometimes I think especially in animation things go off down different paths and find their way back but I do feel we found our way back to what we wanted it to feel like to watch the film have you attended any screenings with any kids because there were lots of kids in my screening and it was really lovely to hear them laugh at jokes and to just be so wow It is. It is. And that was one of the weird things because we made the movie in lockdown. We didn't get to screen to families, which you usually do in order to get feedback and go, oh, that bit's boring. That bit needs more jokes. And so I literally didn't know how it was going to play until we were at premieres. And that was the first time we had packed audiences with children in and hearing like loud laughter, etc. And 
kids in tears, you know, and stuff yeah. like that. That it touches me so much. And all movies are hard. Animated movies are insanely hard. And there have been so many kind of, you know, thick challenges that we've had to overcome in the making of this film. But someone sent me a photograph of her six year old kid who is scared of the dark. And he'd seen the movie and he loved Ron and the Bebox. And as you know, it's not really a spoiler that Ron acts as a nightlight, you know? Yeah. And she bought the nightlight version of the tour. And she sent me a picture of her six-year-old with this nightlight wrapped in his arms asleep. And I just thought everything falls away. And then me as a writer, as a writer director, you know, the connection to that kid that you've given them that, that is the most brilliant reward. That's really sweet. But also as an adult, I want the, the light up toys. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, because Pete know. and I make films for ourselves, you know, and we both became parents at a similar time and quite late in life. You know, I've known Pete forever, but we both left it quite late to have children. That's partly why we love writing for animation, because we're writing for our highly intelligent, sophisticated kids who are often not fully respected by movies. I think quite a lot of yeah. movies play down to children yeah. and television, whereas books don't. Books are really sophisticated. Yeah. But, you know, my biggest passion right now is to me, the biggest threat to cinema is not streamers. It's actually not giving kids intelligent enough movies that make them love the cinema. That's my kind of, you know, aim in life is like give our kids movies that are as interesting and entertaining to them as really good books are. And then we'll have a cinema in the future, you know. And I write for ourselves. We write for ourselves as comedians. We write for ourselves as parents. And we write for ourselves thinking these are the movies we'd like to watch with our kids. No, and I think that's wonderfully well said because kids are so much smarter than we give them credit for, especially this generation of kids. They've yeah. seen it all. They have access to it all. There's nothing you can really hide from, <laughs> from yeah, them. Exactly. They've seen all this kind of outrageous material that they've had access to. And yet, you know, sometimes in kind of family films, we're protecting them from the slightest bit yeah. of, you know. And to me, the great animated films when I was growing up were terrifying. Like they made me really emotional. Bambi's mother dying was devastating. Yeah. yeah. You know, madly leaving the jungle at the end. I was overwhelmed with grief about that. The terror in 101 Dalmatians. And mm -hmm. I, why can't we let children, as long as you take them through the story and you give them resolution, like in a book, I right. think you should go there with all the emotions, you know? I agree. And that's why I really enjoyed watching the screening with a room full of kids because it hits yeah. differently when you're like, that's so funny. I find that funny, but this kid finds it hilariously funny. <laughs> like the, I love their feedback. That's so um, sweet. Before I let you go, I have one more question. And it's what advice would you give your your younger writer self, young Sarah? That's a really good question. You know what I would say? And actually, this is a piece of advice that my lovely friend Pete gave me halfway through my career because I did all sorts of different things. And there came a point in life where I felt like, oh, I've wasted my time. This I haven't achieved X, Y, and Z, and I should have done. And you know, you're looking around in the way all writers do, and you go, This person's done all this and I haven't, and blah, blah, blah. And he said to me, every single job that you do. Whatever it is, writing or even any other work that you do around, you know, anything that's going on, any kind of screen, you learn something from and nothing is wasted. And therefore, I would say to younger, you know, any writers sort of early on in their career, don't go looking for the perfect gig. Just do stuff. Do more. Whatever it is, you learn from it. And also, I think you have to do it for its own sake. If you don't actually enjoy the process, the day to day life, do something else because it's really hard. <laughs> And so much of what you do doesn't go anywhere. But unless you actually enjoy the day to day of that job, <laughs> that's what it should be for. It should just like be not about your ambition. It should be about enjoying the process. I mean, yeah, because 18 years on script, three years in production, you better love it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, exactly. And like how many scripts get written that never get made and all of that thing. So I think it's if you're led by ambition about what you're trying to achieve, I think you're in for a miserable life. If you're led by pleasure and joy in the day to day process of what you put on a page, then you have a long and happy career. <laughs> And that is a perfect way to end our episode with that nugget. Sarah Smith, thank you so much. Everyone, Ron's Gone Wrong is currently in theaters. 
I saw it in the theater, but I can't wait till it comes on VOD to watch it at home as well, because I, I just one of those comfort films. You can have a, a, some tea, a little bowl of soup, snuggle with your family on the couch and just laugh together. So I'm really excited for people to experience that during the winter season. I think it'll be one of those Christmas hits, you know, the ones and the kids will be really excited and they'll all buy the sleeping, glowing dolls. <laughs> and I will too. It's on my Christmas <laughs> list. Sarah, thank you for staying up in London, chatting with me today. I appreciate you. I look forward to your next project because I really, really loved this movie. It it hurts my soul how much I loved it. All right, Sarah, thank you. Have a great day. Thanks so much. Thanks to Sarah Smith and as always to Sade Sellers for a great chat. Ron's Gone Wrong is in theaters right now. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you liked this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the show on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about new episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and on Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. This podcast was produced by Kayla Guess and co-produced by Emma Vranich. Editing is by Sean Bonnet. Music is by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Thank mm-hmm. you.